Hi everybody, welcome back. This is Instructor Phil in Character Design. Sorry as I move the mic over here for a minute. Uh, we're gonna lecture today and talk about the importance of silhouette shape, okay? And what it does and why it is probably not only relative to character design, one of the most important things, but without a doubt in all of design. So most of you that are in here that are interested in fields of animation or, or entertainment, part of what you are responsible for doing is becoming a good designer. And that in itself is something that's totally different than the average artist. And there's a reason for that. The average artist who might be interested in painting or some other, you know, uh, ceramics, so on, whatever that might be, a lot of what they're doing is based on observation and based on creating something like right in front of them. And sometimes they don't go through a design process. And what I've noticed is that in the world of art and fine art, a lot of times they do have a little bit of a design process, but not nearly as much as what we do in terms of thumbnails and sketching and thinking and planning about what it is that we're getting into. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you right now what are called core cognitive base shapes. Okay, when you were born as a child, the first thing your little sponge starts to do in your brain is you start to retract information, okay? And you start looking at things. So when you're born, you, you immediately look at the face of your mom or your dad and you sort of memorize part of the silhouette shape of their face. You also listen for their voice and you hear their voice. So as a little baby, and those of you that have ever had little kids, you'll notice if they're crying as soon as you walk into a room and they see you, a little baby will stop, or if they hear your voice, they will stop, right? So the way we're sort of built is as soon as you start to adapt to things around you, the first thing you start to do is this. You start to memorize the shapes of objects around you, and you do it first by silhouettes. So there's a huge importance to that because it's the way we visually read something. When we first look at something, we don't look at the details of that tree. I don't look at that and go, oh, well, that's a, a maple tree or that's a uh, South Washington bell flower spiky tree. Okay, we don't do that at all. We look at the tree itself and we look at the silhouette of it and we're able to identify, hey, that is a base tree. And the same thing happens when we start going through different structures. We can look at something eventually, even as children, and we realize, hey, that's a leaf. Okay, so kids start in this process between like one to two, once they start to talk, they've been taking in so much information, kids will point at stuff. So a kid will be sitting there and he will point over at something and he will be like, plane, because he sees a plane in the air. He doesn't, he can't tell if it's a 747 or a seven ton Airbus. He can't tell any, any of that. All they can tell is it is a dedicated plane, okay? So, and the same thing with looking over, you might be like, dog, okay? But the great thing about silhouette is not only can you notice it's a dog, but you can also start to notice the specific details of something. For example, can you tell me what kind of dog that is? And how would you know that? The shape. The shape, that's right. And well, and I had a boxer, so I know it, right? So there's something specific about the shape of that. Did, can you tell me if that boxer is mad or crazy right now? No, you can't tell me if he is angry or sad or any of that that's all emotional based content that's not what we're going for right now so what that means is that if you can communicate base shapes to a viewer and they have a better understanding of what those shapes mean then adding the detail and all that other stuff ends up being icing on the cake okay so let's go back to being a little kid again right this is part of your cognitive learning process right where you're processing information and you're creating in the back of your mind a visual library of what things look like so even if you're not an artist it doesn't matter this is how people this is what people do you create your brain is filled with this ability to go in and look at all these different shapes now as a kid you might look at that you'd be bird bird okay you don't know what kind of bird we just know it's a bird right but that's all that matters because this type of shape design from nature and from uh real life items is what goes on to support everything else down the world in terms of design, okay? Then what ends up happening a little bit later is you start to see more custom shapes, okay? We start, to, we have the ability to not only see a fish, but now we can target different types of animals by looking at the silhouette shape, right? So I can look at this here and I can realize like, hey, 
round happy shapes might be in a turtle or a crab, octopus, right? Squared shapes, okay, that might be what I call tapered, okay? You have like marlin, you have sort of shark, you have a piranha, okay? And then we also get into this. We get into, this is also next door to this, okay? You get into triangular shapes, okay? So now when we get into the triangular shapes, we have a stingray, we have a shark, hammerhead shark. So do you notice one of the things that starts to make a transition with nature? Which is what? Round shapes are nice, happy shapes, okay? Square shapes going into, and especially tapered shapes, because tapered means this. We're doing this, and I should have put a, an image in here of the head of a rattlesnake. How do you know the difference between a rattlesnake and, let's say, a California king snake, which killed rattlesnakes, okay? Uh, the head of a rattlesnake is in the shape of a V. It has a tapered head like this. And if you look at like a king cobra or other poisonous shape, excuse me, snakes, they also have V-shaped heads. That is nature's way of telling you, I am dangerous, stay away from me. And what's actually sort of fascinating, I should put this up for my next, next time I lecture on this, is did you know a California king snake, right, is immune to the poison? So what it does is when it, it, a rattlesnake will come up and bite it, and then it'll sit there and, and act like it's dying, and then it'll stop, and when the, when the rattlesnake comes over, It'll then wrap itself around it and tighten and kill the rattlesnake. And the rattlesnake doesn't know what happened. And then he sits and he goes, well, I'm immune to your poison, so you're not going to affect me. And it's really cool how nature has that, those variation of marks, okay? Something else that nature does, not to go on a tangency here, but nature also marks creatures with color, okay? Have you ever seen, um, there's a, 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 like a red snake that has different colors on it and uh, there, there's a poisonous one, and then there's a California-based one, and there's an old rhyme that goes with it, okay? Red and yellow will kill a fellow, red and black venom will lack. So if nature puts red and black stripes next to each other, you're, you're, it's not harmful. If nature puts two bright colors next to each other, it's a way of telling you, hey, stay away, it's poisonous, it will hurt you, okay? All right, so this right here is a pivotal transition to me because once you get to this, you really, as a child, start to understand some of the basics of things that are good or bad or interesting, okay? Which brings us to this, okay? What happens when we see a really interesting silhouette shape? We look at this, and we know it might be a type of deer, right? But then again, it could be with the antlers on it. It could be a reindeer. It could be, um, you know, a, a, does any, any hunters in here know the difference between female deers, male deers? I'm not a hunter, so I'm just asking because I know there's a difference in the type of antlers that they have and so on, um, and people can tell that right off. And so that would be important information for me to discover if I was having to draw um, some type of a, of a deer-based character, right? Okay, then especially in that transition of silhouette shapes, we immediately start to learn things that are bad or not good, okay? For example, spiders. Okay? The silhouette shape of a dedicated spider. When we see that as a child, we see our mom's reaction to it. Or if we see this little guy here scurrying across the floor, you see your mom jump. You see a mouse or a rat and, and you know, people freak out. I actually opened up my, my sock drawer once and I had a mouse jump out in the air like two feet right in front of me. And I'm like, what the hell? I didn't know it came inside and, and decided to, they love burrowing in little soft, warm areas. And it was in my sock drawer. And it, like, scared the bejesus out of me. And uh, anyway, so, all right, but you see what I'm talking about here with shapes? I don't have any details in these, but I have a visual read, and not only a visual read on what the animal is, but I also can go into very specifics and start learning about good shapes and bad shapes in relation to if something is, is going to be a predator or if it's going to be friendly or whatnot based off of what we were just talking about right here, okay? All right, so... Um, and then something else that's pretty cool, too, is towards that, as we get a little bit older, you start to go through the stage of memorizing shapes where you can look at that, right? And then you, you can say, well, hey, that's like an oak tree because it's thicker. That's not an oak tree. So you start to understand the relationship between this, the thickness of objects and their silhouette reads in relationship to what it communicates, okay, which is pretty important. All right, so what happens after that is we basically 
um, as kids, what happens, and this is how we work as artists, we have a series of core primitive shapes that we use. Okay, we have circles, we have diamonds, we have cylinders, we have squares, we have stars, hearts, okay? Four circles put together like a clover shape, right? We have a torus, which is also known as a donut, okay? Triangles, and then when you combine all these core shapes together, what happens is we start to create something that has meaning and it has value, okay? So a lot of times in the art process, the way I need you to think is what are the core shapes of a character? So for example, our first assignment, okay, we have the turtle that you're gonna design, we have a bird that you're gonna design, okay, and I put in a couple other, uh, other variants, we have a cat. So before you even start drawing, the first thing that you should be thinking of is A, what is my reference to look at at those characters, right? And then outside of the reference, the next important thing is going to be what are the shapes of that particular character? How do I bring those core primitive shapes together to make it feel and read a particular way? So for example, let's start with a turtle. What's a turtle's core shape? What's the core shape if you had to just draw from your memory without looking at a reference of the shell? It's round, right? And then what's the core shape of the head? It's round. Turtles have a little bit of a neck. Now you can exaggerate the neck. I've been to the zoo before and I've seen turtles with like really long necks that can throw their head out and bite you. And I've seen turtles with small necks. I've seen turtles with squash shells, but they all come back to the same basic core primitive shapes that guide us on a particular direction, okay? All right, so give me a second here. Let me minimize this window. Let's go over and let's take a look at, what did I do here, okay? Um, and the principle of shapes also exists within landscapes and environments as well. We'll touch on that in just a minute. I'm going to show you a couple more samples here. Okay, but I'd like to sort of come in the middle here. And in the beginning, as we start talking about shapes, there's an artist that I'd like to, I'd like to show a couple artists to give you guys a little bit better idea about what we're talking about. But um, I'll come back and I'll show you at the very end here. So let me just continue forward. I want to show you Pascal Campion and Carter Goodrich. So you get a better idea of what's really happening with shapes and how these character designers are implementing it into part of their drawing process. So let's go back over here and let's start to take a look at what happens when we get, this is basically an arrangement of flowers. Now, here is a great example of, you know, we have a butterfly in here and then we have a couple flower shapes. By duplicating our shape over and over, this is when we start to go into environment design a little bit. Now we can communicate the feeling of a soft field or plants or other creatures in relationship with each other, okay? In this process, what is basically happening is we are getting closer and closer to more complex shapes. So now we're still dealing with silhouettes and visual reads. If I were to, if I were to point at this and say, Look, alligator, you'd think there would be something wrong because that is not the shape of an alligator. That is the shape of a simplified bird, okay? In fact, you can look at these and you can even pull out different types of birds out of there, okay? Anyone want to hear, know anything about birds? Even if you didn't and you weren't a bird expert, like I know if you were to look at one of these, you can tell it's like more of a sparrow. That is the shape right there of a woodpecker, okay? And then down here, what kind of bird is that, folks? That's a hummingbird. We know that because we know what? The long nose, the wings are in the back, fluttering super fast, right? So right there, you don't even have to be an expert on birds, and you could already identify three different birds just by looking at part of the silhouette, okay? And the great thing is, is as we move forward and we start getting into more complex shapes, we, we have the principles of shape and silhouette apply to humans. It applies to movement. Okay, especially in movement when you start combining two different animals together, all right? Now we start looking at, sorry, it's a little blurry there. It's the only one I could get. Um, we start looking at people on horses and doing something in an activity, jumping over a fence and some type of equestrian activity, right? So um, what does this mean? This means if I wanted to draw somebody attacking a village, all I would have to do is figure out the shape of the horse running person on top of the horse with a sword hanging in the air and a shield on the other side, right? That would give you the feeling of attacking, okay? So you can even look at these shapes and you can even determine part of the movement out of this, okay? 
if I were to say, pick the shape that looks like, if this is one, two, three, and four, if I say, pick the shape that looks like you are jumping, you would pick number two and four, correct? Right. If I said, pick the, pick the shape of the, of the character that's riding towards me, you would probably pick one or two, right? Um, if I said, pick the shape that looks like the character is more likely to fall off the horse and the horse is unstable, you might say two or three in that case, right? So I can start developing emotional reads and content from my silhouette language immediately, okay? And what's really cool is if you take and apply this to character design and then you take it a step further and you apply this into environments and storytelling, that's when all the principles come together, okay? Because when you look at this here, what do we have, okay? Well, how do you know it's Indiana Jones? There's no detail there. It's not Harrison Ford. How do you know? Because what is the shape language of Indiana Jones, folks? That's right, a whip and a hat. And what else about Indiana Jones? He doesn't like snakes, right? See, you're nailing it, Matt, right? Okay. And then what about the boy behind him? Short round, right? Looks pretty close to short round. And how do we identify short round? That's right. A baseball cap. And he also had a backpack on. So visual shape language is also part of storytelling. So inside a movie, it is the director's job when he first introduces a character to you to give you visual traits of that character that you remember. So that way if you see somebody who is about 12 years old and he has a hat on a backpack on, you automatically identify that person as short round, okay? That's what we call a character lineup. And so when you see Indiana Jones, Indiana Jones has his classic hat, he has a whip, he also had like a little satchel bag he would carry. He did carry a gun, sometimes he would use it, but there was some argument from anti-gun people being like, oh, you shouldn't have a gun. But he did carry a gun. Does anyone know, remember what kind of gun it was? It was an old school gun. It was a revolver. It was like a six or eight shot revolver that he carried in a little leather satchel. So those are the common attributes and shape language of that character. So any time in the movie, regardless of light conditions, you could automatically look and you could identify that character in any scene or storytelling. Why? Because the director already set it up in the very beginning when he introduced you to the characters. Okay? All right. Now, what about the location here? Is that set in the middle of downtown Fullerton? No, it's not. Is it set in caves down by Laguna Beach? Nope, it's not. And how do we know that? Well, we look in the back here and we have this like sort of viney structure. Okay? We have some type of a, of a, it looks like steps. It look like old ancient stone, right? So it looks like he's in a cave. So do you see all the information that's translating through this piece right now? And here is one of my biggest dilemmas about working with students, okay? And their designs, especially when they go from character design and they start going to environment design, is I look at their piece and I go, you have all this detail pinned on your piece, but you're not giving me any silhouette read. You need to give me explanations in the silhouette. So look here, to me, this is just a golden piece of example on why this is so important, okay? All right, and I'm gonna show you another reason why. Give me a second here, I have to back up to this older folder. My folder's got all shuffled around. Um, here's another why, another reason why shapes are so important, okay? Is, do you remember this shape right here, okay? What was that shape again? Bird. What kind of bird? Pretty close to like a sparrow. They have this sort of arched back feel to them. Okay, give me a second. I got to go back to my other folder, which is on my secondary monitor. And okay, so guess what? In nature, you can take things from nature because nature has a way of making things work automatically. Okay, for example, not to go, I'm going to explain this and I'm going to show you what I'm getting at here. A leafing structure. Does anyone know what a leafing structure is in nature? You take a tree. A tree is one solid tree, and then it goes to a branch. And then that branch goes to then a secondary limb, and then it goes to a third, to a fourth, and to a fifth. Okay? Gee, what else has that same structure? The human body. 
Here's our tree structure. It's our core body. And then we go into one limb that breaks off. That goes into a second limb. That limb goes into, splits into, into a series of more. That splits into a series of smaller bones. So our whole body structure, if I were to draw it up here, is based off of this premise. It's like a branch. That branch then splits into another <coughs> arm. That arm then splits into a leaf. Excuse me, little miniature branches, with, which then split into like different leaves. It's the same principle in all of nature. Okay, you look at a dog, it's the same way. So you have one core bone, okay, so you have like a base leg, you have a femur, and then from your femur, you go down to a tibia and a fibia, right? Down below, and then after that, you go into a series of metacarpal bones on the feet, which then branch over, and then you go into toes that have even more bones. So you see how it keeps branching? So there are things that are happening in nature that you can learn from that you can apply into part of your design. And the same thing is true with this. You take a bird, that bird can dive and fly pretty fast. So what happens when you take that and then you take that? Okay? So engineers figured out how come some of these birds were so good at flying and diving and twisting? How come they couldn't be pulled up sometimes on little base radar? Yes, radar can't pick up sometimes birds flying through them because the angles of the birds or a little bit deflective to the radar. Now, if you have a bunch of birds coming in, that's really important for somebody flying an airplane to know, right? Like the movie Sully, okay? But you can take part of this design language of nature and you can incorporate that into your designs of vehicles and characters, right? And all you're doing is strengthening the relationship between the initial silhouette read and what it's conveying to the viewer, okay? It's extremely important. Okay, so let me back up here. There's also, there's an image, I believe, from Lockheed Martin where they show that transition of the bird to one of the first shapes to the finished shape of the stealth fighter. And you can see part of nature just like this, carrying right through part of that. It's a great visual read and there's a huge importance to part of that silhouette, okay? So um, give me a second here and let me grab my other folder. So we went from like a base complex shape and this is the fun part of character design. What happens here now? What happens when we start thinking about all of our characters lined up, when we start thinking about the communication of their silhouette shape and what that views, what, what feeling that's giving to the viewer? This is extremely important because this allows us to start planning a sensibility of, of, of feeling before we go into detail, remember, detail is the one thing that kills artists. It really is. Because we have a tendency to over-render and over-detail. And before you get to that rendering phase, in fact, last night in my prop design class, I was just chewing out a couple of my students, because I said, go do pages of thumbnails, and you know what they did? Pages of rendering. They did little drawings, and they were rendering. I said, we don't care about the light source direction right now. A rendering is when we are cognitive of a light source coming from a particular direction. It creates light side against dark side. And then it, that's the way we show dimensionality of an object. We don't need to get into that right now. So what we need to do is think about part of our silhouette shape and what that communicates. And here is probably one of my most favorite examples. Okay, This is a really talented artist named Ben Morrow. Okay? Uh, he's a concept artist. And he works realistically and does a lot of realism-based images. I'm pretty sure he went to Art Center. Really talented guy. But the thing I love about this is, remember how we were talking a little bit before about the importance of the visual reads of Short Round and Indiana Jones? Look at all these characters. So I know looking down here at the very bottom, you see all the detail. But one of the things that Art Center is really good at doing is everything that I'm teaching you about right now. Okay, They convey because they, they have industry people there. Art Center is an industry-based school where your teachers are coming to teach to you that have 10, 15 plus years experience and that gets put in the classroom. The only difference is, is that people don't fall asleep in the back of their classes like they do in here because people are paying more attention and you're paying $160,000 to go to Art Center. So you're not going to waste your freaking time at Art Center. You're now at a school with an upper echelon of artists where you have to work three times as hard, right? Because, number one, you're paying money. Number two, you're in the presence of other artists that are trying to get to greatness. 
And that is one of the great things I loved about working in entertainment is I'm sitting there in a studio with another artist that has a totally different background than me and his job is to bust his hide and work really good and we can sit and have great conversations about shape design and talk about composition and run theories by each other, right? Because now I'm basically, that's like becoming a pro professional ball player. There's something about getting to talk shop with professionals. Well, this is part of the language that professionals use. It's the language we use in design. Because what really frustrates me is I'll go over all this information. I'm bringing this to you at a community college level. So you don't have to pay $160,000. You can work your hide off and develop an awesome portfolio and know how to become a really great designer. But it's your decision on whether or not you want to fall asleep in the back of the classroom. Okay, or come to class on time, or do the work that you have to do, which tells me you're not serious and you're wasting time. So going back to this, the only difference between here and Art Center is twofold. One is some of you here are in different levels. Okay, Number two is that you didn't have to pay $160,000 to go to school. It's a great school. I'm not knocking it. I totally recommend it. It's awesome. I've sent students to that program, but... I have them come back to me and they go, guess what we're talking about in entertainment design? Yeah, what? Silhouettes, what are we talking about in your class? I'm like, of course, because that's what top level people do when they design. We think about the visual shapes and reads. Oh, and by the way, people don't fall asleep in the back of the class in Art Center, okay? That will not happen, because why would you spend that type of money, okay? Look at that right there. Now it changes our focus on character design. So if I were to say uh, A, B, and C, right? This guy's A, B, and then that's C. Which character is more likely to have problems picking up a pencil? Which one would it be? C. C? What about B? Those big clumpy hands. One's a blaster. Okay. If I were to say which one is the leader of that pack, which one would you guess? A. A. Well, why A? He's got the captain hat. That's right. Okay. Aha. See, secondary props that start giving us more information about what's happening. Which one of those characters is more likely to be able to support the weight of 10 cars on top of him? B. Why? Is he, so, does he have cars on him right now? No. It's because of his shape. He's thick and broad. It means something, all right? Which character would be more likely to steal treasure from the bottom of the ship? See, that's right, because he's skinny and sort of sneaky looking, right? And it's just, why the captain wouldn't do that. He's a captain. The big brute wouldn't do that. So do you understand the importance now? This is where it starts to connect to this level, is everything that you're doing is based off of this, okay? And this is when I'll talk to somebody. Um, I wanted to show this because this isn't relevant to this. Well, it is relevant, but... One of the first moving motion pictures ever done was in France, and it was an animated short using silhouettes, okay? So it's when they had first invented the basic foundations of a cam camera to take one picture. So then this artist realized that they could pose. They made a cutout of like the human body, and they would take the cutout and have it against light so you had silhouette shapes of it, and then they would take a picture and then move the picture again. And then they would move the silhouette and put all the pictures in a row. And it was one of the first animations that ever happened. And it was based off of the principle of using the silhouette. So you could have somebody moving and it came to life. And then it started to convey something. Okay? All right. So look at how cool that is. Look at the variation in shapes there. Okay? So now you'll see the language that I start to use in the classroom. I am bringing language that I learned actually... Not when I was at Cal State, okay? I learned more of it when I was in the industry, being around people like Michael Spooner and um, taking classes with Paul Felix and Robert St. Pierre and a bunch of these other artists, Sam Mitchlap, who's probably gonna be one of our guest lecturers or artists in residence coming here, right? We started talking about shape language. What was the visual read? What did it communicate to the viewer? How did he get from point A to point C? Does that make sense? All of those things started to come together. So as you start working on your designs, you have to start thinking about, sorry, this is blurry, okay? But if I were to say, you know, which one is the friendly creature you could ride, you would probably pick this, this guy here or that guy, okay? You would not pick this guy right here.
because that guy is not friendly. It has long angular shapes that look like they're made to pierce your skin and kill you, right? That's simple, okay? So here's something that we can start to do though. You can take part of your silhouette shapes and you can start, sometimes we can draw on top of them in white, okay, which is totally fine. And here's the other thing that I've sort of discovered is not all of your silhouette shapes have to be perfectly black. Sometimes, as long as they're a dark gray, so what that means is you could take a line, throw down a rough line of the character, put a dark gray on it, and then the dark gray is acting as a silhouette guy, but then you can still see a little bit of rough internal line about the character. That's something else that you can do that helps translate. I, have a, I think I have another example coming up here. Look at the importance of this, right? Look at the feeling. Number one, the first thing you see, is, and then we'll get to this. This is one of our exercises we're going to do later in this class where we do a lineup of variations of characters, right? So when we have a lineup, we immediately have to start thinking about the variation of shape in relationship to the personality hierarchy, okay? So if I were to, looking at these, if I were to say which character, so if that's one, two, three, four, five, six, or seven there, okay? Which character is more likely to be the evil one that would put a spell on me? It's seven, okay? Which one is the one who's likely to fight off an enemy coming into town? Six. Number six, that's right. Which one would be likely to see into the future? That's right, three would, okay? Which one might be a religious-based character walking around with those... Uh, they have them in Catholicism and also in Greek Orthodox. The, the little fireball thingies with the dust or whatever. Number two, okay. Which one would be likely to eat a whole entire uh, animal himself after it was cooked? Number one, right? Okay. Which one is likely to be the princess that everybody likes who has a little bit of an attitude? Number four, okay. And... I don't even know how to describe this one right here. There, you, I was going to just say mysterious, maybe wandering traveler, sp spy, or you know what I thought about when I saw that? It reminded me something they did in a Star Wars movie? Mercenary. Bounty Hunter, where he's got, the character has this weird disguise on, and remember, and then all of a sudden the character sits down and pulls it off, and who was it? Remember? And... It was um, Princess Leia had the and the voice was changed. Yes, I will do that. And then had this weird mask, and she rips it off, and she's like there. And then there was part of the rescue attempt, right? Remember that? Okay, so that could be to disguise a personality as well. But look at that. We just went through every one of those characters, and you just told me what their emotional content and feel is, and we haven't even started really doing any. There's no detail work. There's no paint work. There's no color work. There's nothing. So here is where part of this lecture takes you is that basically if you don't have that form of communication inside the silhouette you have failed it's really that simple so if you tell me this happens all the time we'll put our work up and i'm not picking on you my job is to be honest with you and make you a better designer and so for me to do that if you tell me that turtle in the middle is an evil evil i can't talk evil it's a bad evil turtle and I go to look at it, and it's all round shapes, there's a problem. Because what would bad and evil be? It's going to be rectangular shapes and tapered shapes and trapezoids and stuff like that, right? And so if, you know, this happens in this class where someone starts going off on this tangency and they go, well, look, that, 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 that character, he's a necromancer or a vampire, and he's this, and he's that, and he's evil, and, and, and he's got cousins, and, and they sat down, and they had a meeting, and they put a curse on him, and he's the evil one, and he has to go out and kill people, and he give me this whole long story. And I look at the, the image, and I go, not getting it, sorry. Everything you just described is not happening in the image, because the silhouette shape does not match that description you just gave me. So you have to go back and think about that, and put it in to part of your design. All right, let me, let me come over here. I had... Um, just since we're talking about silhouette, guess what, folks? This goes right into prop design as well. And if it goes into prop design, it goes into environment design. Okay, because an environment is just a room filled with a bunch of props. So you could take a look at these. Now, who in here, which is probably one of my female students, is not a gun expert? Okay. 
Great. So you're not a gun expert. Okay, that's great. So if I were to look at now, you're not a gun expert, right? You've never probably shot a gun. You probably haven't had a gun around you. Which is the gun that Clint Eastwood would be more, more likely to shoot in there from one of my gun experts? Would it be this one or that one? Well, how do you know you're not a gun expert? How would you know that? How do you know it's older? You can't see the condition of the wood or the metal, can you? Oh, the hand, the shape. Okay. All right. But you're not a gun expert, right? There's also, just to give homage to Marshall, way back in the day when I had his composition class, Marshall came into composition once, and he said, can anyone in here speak Portuguese? And we said, no. And he goes, I'm going to play a song for you in Portuguese, and I want you to tell me what it's about. And he played it. And it was this woman with this beautiful voice singing. And we stopped. And he said, now everyone pull out a piece of paper and write what that song's about. And everybody wrote it down and handed it in. And guess what? Everyone in the whole entire class said it was a love song. But we couldn't speak Portuguese. How do we know it's a love song? Because of the flow, the rhythm, the tone of voice. Does you see what I'm getting at here? It's, it's the cousin related to this. Okay which is part of the structure. Now, if I were to say between, um, this might be more of a stretch, but if I were to say between this one and this one, which one looks like it would be a gun that would shoot a tranquilizer dart? Between this one or that one? The top one. Because tranquilizers are long cylinder shapes, and that has a long cylinder barrel. Okay? So, and then if I were to say, which one looks like the gun that Al Pacino would pull out in Scarface and just start shooting like crazy, you would pick something probably like this. Because it has a longer magazine, it's more detailed, it has more of a military feel. There's a word called tactical. That describes that okay and it happens in designing too especially with characters and stuff so do you see that you don't have to be a gun expert to get a feel on which one would be you know if i were to say pick two that would be used on a stagecoach you'd go well, that one and this one right there so you know that's the great thing about shapes is that this is part of a, a language that communicates to everybody and everything so utensils have shape language okay um different types of objects that you might use. Okay, we know that that is a blender. We know that is not a rocket launcher, right? But if you were to turn this sideways and then squash and put that on top of it, you can make it look like a rocket launcher very quickly because it has a handle on it, okay? All right, and there's shape language sort of in, in action. This is a great, I found, bless you, I found a great example. What I really like about this is this right here is the original shape. So usually what that means is the first shape you make tends to be boring because it's your brain putting out its first idea on paper. After that, once we think about squashing and stretching the shape, we think about distorting it, we think about variation, we think about counter angle, and then we think about maybe adjusting the handle or putting more gesture onto it, we end up with that. And then that supports all the other elements, okay? All right. Um, a really cool process you can do, something, if I was teaching 2D design here, this is, I actually thought about writing a 2D design class for digital, okay? We would take the silhouette shape of an object, and then we would go into it, and then we would erase from it. And then the white going against the black will create a contrast visual read and give you information on what that particular shape is, okay? All right? So looking at those guys. Those are mechs, right? And robot-based items. You can tell it by looking at it. It looks like a little toy design, basically. Okay? And let's go next here. All right? So if looking at that, if I were to say which one of the... How many people in your airplane experts? No one. Okay? Um, see, I, have a, I memorize this stuff in the back of my mind. I don't know why I always have. But... If I were to say which plane looks like the plane that the Wright brothers flew on their first pass, which one would you pick? 
top left, or maybe one of these, right? Down here, okay? So if I were to say, which plane looks like it flew in World War II and bombed Japan? Wait, did anyone in here go fly in that plane and bomb Japan? After we stroke, strike back at Pearl Harbor? No, no one did, right? And your, maybe your grandparents didn't. So how would you, so it would probably be one of these or maybe this one down here on the bottom, okay? But how would you know that if you didn't go there? What movie have you seen? Pearl Harbor, right? A lot of people have seen that movie. And inside that movie, there has a bunch of shape language from the planes that are being identified. And it's the director's responsibility when setting up a scene to show you the shape of that given prop that is going to define the action of that particular scene, okay? So that right there, any of you that really like to draw and get into character design and storyboarding, that right there is a golden nugget I just gave you. I'm going to give to everybody, even the YouTube community, because I'm going to post, post this up on YouTube, right? Which is, when you get into storyboarding and you set up a scene that's going to happen, you need to think about what some of the key identifiers are going to be of that particular sequence or scene, and you can set up what's going to happen in the very beginning by a quick action. And there's another term for that. Does anyone know what that is? They use it in movie language all the time. So, for example, in the movie of Mice and Men, there's a part in the very beginning where something is going, the character is standing, and he accidentally cuts his hand on something. He reaches down and he grabs a rock. And it's a two-second shot. And then he moves the rock and there's blood on the rock. What is that? Foreshadowing. Foreshadowing. That's right. I would have said foreshadowing. <laughs> but that's the R, right? In perspective. So, but no, it's, it's foreshadowing. So we have the way good film and storytellers and directors have a way of even doing that with shapes up before a scene happens. And we can actually create foreshadowing if it's done correctly and tell the audience what's going to happen before you even get there. And that right there is what makes a great director versus a poor director. Okay. Um, one of the reasons why Alfred Hitchcock was such a great director, anybody know why? He was an artist and he storyboarded out every scene that he did. And then he went in and he thought about what the graphic shapes and silhouettes were of that scene and that action before they happened. So if two people were talking that were friendly, you had round shapes, it was a friendly conversation, you had curves inside the picture plane, right? If somebody was talking to somebody that they were going to rob, he made sure there was a diagonal in there, there was a hard line, he made sure the person that was going to do the robbing had little angles on their shoulders and they had triangles into them because triangular, triangular things are bad. Right? Right. They are. Okay? So, and then here's a little bit more prop design. I just like showing these because I think they're pretty cool. And then you get to this more advanced level, and you're thinking about vehicles. You're thinking about weapons. And what's cool is this is still silhouette, but now we're coming in with a little bit of gray, just creating contrast variation where you can get a read on something very quickly. Right? Right. Okay. I'm going to wrap up this lecture. Give me one minute. I don't mean to go so long. But there's one more part of this to me that's really, really important. And I need to just keep going on it. So um, sorry to make this so long. What happens when we get to the wonderful world of stylization of your shapes? Look at that bird shape in there. Look at the stretch on it, okay? Look at that, that's beautiful. Look at the shapes of those rocks and all the variants and the curves and the feeling and the visual weight in there, right? So there's an old expression. I don't know who it came from, but I've heard it, and I like to mention it in all my classes. It's not the assignment that's boring. It's you that is boring, okay? Because you can't push it to the next level. Always get students, oh, you're going to draw a cat and a bird. And I'm like, have fun with it. Push it. Use your imagination. If I gave you the assignment to draw rocks, everybody would be pouting about it, right? Look at how beautiful that page is. And that's what separates out good design. Look at that. Man, look at that silhouette right there. That just makes me want to stand up and go, woohoo, right? And shake my arms across. That is having fun and dancing. And, and if I were to say, you know, look at that. Does that not look like a James Bond girl? Absolutely it does. Okay? 
there is such an importance about understanding shapes and designs before you do anything you should be taking your sketch and filling it in with black or dark gray to figure out what that communicates look at that body right there you know look at that i just see that shape and i just want to do the voice of this person talking like like oh my god he was like totally rude and it's like you know you get that out of that and you could come over here look at this shape what's the voice to get out of that shape i told you to clean your room three times now right so now I can start coming on the to these, you know, and go over and talk about, you know, like look at this lady. She's like, I'm sneaking into the other line at Macy's to check out faster, right? There's a visual descriptor to everything that takes place, okay? And this is when, I know that's really rough. This is when, you know, the other side of it. And then I want to show you um, real quick here. Everything we just talked about. I have a couple artists to show you, but where's my environment? Okay, sorry. And then voila, boom. This is the importance why every one of you in here should eventually take my perspective class, face drawing for entertainment arts, perspective, and then you take environment. Look, see that? You can now start creating environments and worlds based off of shapes. All it is is a couple splotty elements inside a location. That's it. That conveys information. And then, God forbid, you go in there and do a positive-negative effect on that. Now you start to get more cool information that's taking place. Okay, we talked about that in the beginning. Look at that. What happens when you take a, you could take a cool shape, and then we just, we're going about to do this in the digital paint class, too, coming up. Okay, where we take shapes, we're going to make a graveyard, and all we're going to do is create some brushes, stamp a couple of tombstones around, and then we're going to introduce a light source. Where's the light source coming from now? That's right, you can tell because you have angle light coming in. Now all of a sudden, we're introducing a fact that creates rendering. So by introducing a light, we're now introducing something that creates a little bit more of an emotional impact, okay? So everything, look at this. This is a picture of someone's side yard. Look at the silhouettes in it. We see, we see silhouettes all the time. They're around everything that we do. It's the way that we process information. We process actions on how people are or in, interacting with each other, if they're kissing, if someone's getting robbed. So we can look at shapes from all over the world. So if someone had to hire me to design a building, the Eiffel Tower that had been knocked over or under attack, I just go look at the shape of the Eiffel Tower and I move it over and then I set it up in a scene where the silhouette works and then I go back in and do it and I add a light source and I paint it in a particular direction. That's the way we attack our problem solving. And if you do that, you can start creating really nice worlds and start doing some really fantastic storytelling, okay? The sky becomes the, the limit at that point. You can do whatever you want. And look at that. Cool jungle scene, right? Look at the plants in there. Look at the backgrounds, you know? That's just shape with a little bit of light put into it. Okay? That's basic rules of atmospheric perspective. An atmospheric perspective is really simple. As things recede away from you, they get lighter. So then you have a series of different shapes that drop their value and lightness as they recede, and that creates depth. Okay? Look at that. Is that a school? No. What is that? Construction or where would you see big cranes picking stuff up at? Huh? Huh? Yeah, demolished buildings, or it could be a dump. It could be a landfill. Is that a landfill? No. That's a little boy on a quest in the middle of a forest. Okay? All right? That's some old town with an old train lying around. Okay? That's somewhere downtown, like an industrial area. All right? What's going to happen to that little boy right there? Is he in danger? Why is he in danger? He's just standing on a rock. What spider? Oh my gosh, there's a spider there. And it's got fur on it, which makes it even worse. And it's got pointy legs. It's five times bigger than the silhouette That's right. No. Oh my god. Now we're getting into composition. What happens in composing? Variations of shapes. Right? Where's the biggest area of contrast? 
The boy. That's right. Now you've learned something else about composing. This is electron silhouettes, and now we're talking about composition. G. Look at the connection between the two, right? So, do you have to be a lighting expert and a rendering expert to tell stories? No. But what do you need to know to tell stories? Shape and how to use it. Okay. Look at that. That's pretty cool, right? Um, that's just a orange and yellow gradient drop behind shapes. That's very common for like a silhouette effect which is caused when the sun is setting and going down. Okay? That's all that is. Is that Czechoslovakia? How do you know that's not Czechoslovakia? Because Eiffel Tower is in it. So you know it's not Czechoslovakia. You know it has to be. And then also look at this cathedral top right there. That is typical of French style cathedrals. Okay? Ooh, look at that. Now we're talking. Now we're talking my world, right? This is the type of stuff I like. Okay? Which, if I said there was a giant oil refinery base, it could be that one on the right, or it could be this one on the left, right? If I said a abandoned aircraft carrier that people built on top of, you might pick this one in the middle, right? What if I said futuristic organic shaped building? You might pick this one on the left, okay? What if I said uh, a giant structure like building out over river? You might pick this one down here, okay? So what's cool is in Photoshop, you can now take these silhouettes and you can turn them into custom shapes and you, or a brush and you could pull it out whenever you want and slap it down on an environment and build something really quickly. So here's a little note to self. Anything you draw on your sketchbook that is a silhouette shape that is pure black, you can scan and bring into Photoshop and I can show you how to do it and you can turn it into a brush or custom shape that you could use. Okay, Look at that environment. Right? It's endless, folks. All this cool stuff with storytelling. Okay? So, real quick, I didn't mean for this lecture to go so long, but it's worth its weight in gold, in my opinion. So, let's come back here. Now, let's take a look at somebody who knows what they're doing, who is a storyteller, who understands how to use shape. This is Sergio Pablos. This is his rendition of Claus. Yes, Santa Claus story. Look at the shapes in there. Look at the vertical trees. Look at the fun shape of the buildings. Do you see it happening? Before you get to the color or anything else, do you see how great it is? Look at that struggle. Look at that guy pushing that carriage with the horse going up that hill. Look at the, this character walking up here into this like snow village in the middle of nowhere. Look at those buildings. Sorry, I had to do screen grabs to get these images, but you got to do what you got to do. Look at that. I don't know why I keep saying previous image, but do you see what happens there? So good designers know how to use shape. Does he have to be a lighting master to do that? No. The great thing about working in a digital paint is you can do stylized images. You can create stylized work like this. What is in that scene right there? What is the principal lighting effect in that scene right now? I just talked about it three minutes ago. Are Atmospheric perspective. That's right. So now you know, because every one of you that walks out of this room, you'll see atmos atmospheric perspective and everything. You just walk outside and look down Chapman and you'll see it. Things get lighter as they recede. So that means you don't have to be a lighting expert. You have to understand shape and atmospheric perspective and you can start creating really wonderful worlds and become the next great visual development artist that works at a particular studio. It's all about what you want to give towards your, your learning and your craft. Okay? Look at that. Look at those characters. Look at down here. There's my dad right there. Rah! It's like angry at everything. Older guy, right? Here's my buddy Tim. He was a football player here. We called him Sausage Fingers because his fingers were so thick he couldn't pick up a pencil on a table because he had these big sausage fingers. Look at the fingers. Look at how big they are, right? These people are all angry. Look at them all yelling. 
So what does that mean? Are these people angry up there? No, they're the town folk. Look at these people. Ah, they're all screaming and yelling. Good guys, bad guys. Determined right there. Right? All right? That's where it all comes together. And this is what good storytelling is. Okay, so that's Sergio Pablo. All right? Let me show you another really talented guy who is beautiful with shape. Okay, um, where did I do? Okay, actually, ah, there's so many to show. Here's friend, um, oh God, Francis, Francis Vallejo. Okay, look at that. Check that out. Look at the fun character shapes. See how that transfers? See what's happening there in that design? Look at that, the old lady. I love those shapes, really nice designs. Very fun, totally different, okay? Sorry, I don't mean to flip through. I'm just trying to wrap up the lecture really quick. All right, let me close that. Let me show you another window here. One of my all-time favorites. What I do with the folder, though? Okay, here it is. I love that heavyweight guy in his shirt. F you, America, right? Does anyone know what that's from? Despicable Me, opening sequence in Egypt, where they get out and they realize the pyramid was stolen or whatever. That he was one of the he was the boy on the phone. It was like they're out visiting in like Egypt and he's got this FU shirt on. Look at the shape on that character. Look at the shape of the lady. That's uh Carter Goodrich designs for um Brave. Okay. There's so much good design there. Despicable me. God, you have someone like Carter Goodrich. Everything he touches does well. Why? Because the shapes are so well thought out. Look at that. Get away from me. Look at that guy. Carter Goodrich, Ratatouille. Okay. Show you a couple more. All right, let me close that window. Hold on, I had one more to show you what I do with it. Did Sergio have his Denise? I put it in another folder. Hold on, I'm gonna find it. Um, here's my buddy John Navarez, really talented designer. He was up at Pixar for a while. He left. Now he's back down here working in LA. Super talented guy. Great shape master. Okay, he knows how to sketch and apply that. And he knows how to do environments as well. Simple shapes, overlapping, atmospheric perspective. Okay, we'll look at some of his work and draw from it. Okay, give me one sec, resume. And now, one of my favorite artists, Pascal Campion. Okay, super nice guy. Look at these great studies, family studies. He's really great at showing you personal connections of people and relationships. Okay, Pascal Campion. P-A-S-C-A-L, and then I believe it's C-A-M-P-I-O-N. He's French, if you didn't notice. Okay, look at that. Mom running through the park with her daughter. See how bright and energetic these are? They're great shape studies in here. Just beautiful to look at. Uh, art director, has been around a bunch of different studios, has a ton of experience. So this is what he did. He likes to get up in the morning. Every morning he gets up and he does a couple of these. Okay? He's always working. He's always drawing. He's always designing, no matter what. Look at that. Pillow fight with your girlfriend. Just don't fall out the window, right? <laughs> right? You know? Early morning, having a cup of coffee, looking out the window with your cat next to you. Look at the shapes in there. And the other thing he's a genius at is color, local color. Absolutely. Beautiful designs in here. Okay? Look at that. Got some of you guys at home, I hope, right? Not on Xbox, but doing that instead. I tried telling my daughter the other day that the average kid plays two to four hours a day on a digital device. And I told her, imagine if you drew for two to four hours a day. 
how good of an artist you would be. Imagine if two to four hours a day you played the violin, how good you would be, right? That's how you have to think about things in life. The games don't really get you anywhere, okay? And then, let me see, I wanted to show you one more other person here, okay? This is an artist that I really like to show. Her name is Denise Blakely Fuller. Um, she is really, really good at taking shapes and doing really good storytelling aspects with them. So she takes shapes and combines them into uh, environments. And uh, this is actually from way back in the day, but this is some development from a studio called the Magi. Sam Mitchlap was one of the creative directors on it. My buddy John was there. And this is some of the work that they did. So she's using shape language now in environments. You see it happening? See the cool shapes of the mountains, the rocks, okay? The wolf, things overlaid on top of each other, real graphic feel. It's really quite beautiful, okay? It's like the Ansel Adams of, of graphic art storytelling, okay? It's really cool. All right, so that's it. I'm going to wrap up this part of the lecture. So that's, we're at a one hour point, and that is our, what I call, to me, one of the most important parts of all of design. And to me, this is what really separates out the difference between uh, artists and designers. And which, by the way, here, I forgot about this, she had this sheet posted on her blog, which is from a guy named Ken Adam Prop Design. And Ken Adam talked about this. See, real live shapes of creatures, see that over here? So you have real life shapes of creatures, okay? And then you translate that into the design silhouette. So that shark becomes a boat, which ends up looking like that when it has detail on it. And then see that principle right there of the shark from a front view becomes that base, becomes that. That spider becomes that, which gets lit, looks like that. That skull squashed out becomes that, and it looks like that, okay? If you in incorporate that into part of your storytelling process, I guarantee you, you'll be hired and people will use you all the time because you're not just a good draftsman. It's not just because you, you can draw very well or any of that background. It's because you understand part of the visual storying process. And part of that visual storytelling process is based on understanding design. And design, first rule of design, is silhouette shapes and visual reads. They're the first thing that we see when we look at something. Okay? All right, thank you guys.